What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to the Elder Scrolls Podcast. I'm Scott, here with Michael and Drew, as always. And today, we are discussing the Nords, the people of Skyrim. In rather broad terms, so which one of you wants to start us off? Well, that's up for debate, isn't it? Are they the people of Skyrim, or are they intruders from Atmora? Well, they're the people of Skyrim for about uh, 3,000 years plus mm. fourth no yeah. way more no no sorry about 4500 years because there's like 4500 ish of recorded history i think and even more like probably about 500 years more than that so so what you're saying is it does belong to the noughts well i feel like if they've been there for like 5000 years which is i don't know do the math on how many generations of people that is i feel like there's a reasonable claim there right it's a good few generations yeah yeah I mean, it all depends whether kind breed them onto the throat of the world, or if well, they even came at this from it more. Even at this point, it doesn't even really matter. You know what I mean? After that much time, wouldn't you say? Hmm. No, sorry, that's I, I derailed this immediately <laughs> by making you uh, making you pick a side on the uh, on the war. But yeah, well, that's the thing because Ch- Children of the Sky is a, a good text to kind of introduce the Nords because you know they believe they were exhaled on the world by their god Kine, who is the same as Kinnereth. And um, before you really get to know the Nords in Skyrim, they're they're a lot more mysterious and almost alien than just kind of Northern Scandinavian almost. Uh, inspired humans you know what you've got first of all them being the idea of them being exhaled they take quite literally in the sense that they believe they are eternal outsiders and invaders wherever they are you know any anywhere they conquest they have nothing in common even with other humans so it kind of goes against the idea that they were just needic settlers just like you know mm. the bretons and the north uh, bretons and the imperials <clears throat> And I do like that in its earlier sort of incarnations of the of the lore that them being breathed onto the onto the onto the world, like breath inherently being such like a powerful um, thing in their culture and such an important thing because the breath becomes you know the thorn and like you know shouting all of these words. It's kind of interesting that like you know the you can imagine like as in organs like the tongue and lungs and stuff become far more um, relevant in their culture and it's just it's just an interesting sort of uh, yeah pieces. well skyrim is like you know it, it makes total sense that skyrim the way we see it isn't just a frozen wasteland because that's not the best for exploration and for an rpg mm. but you know the uh, a description of them i think it's also from children of the sky is saying the further north you go into skyrim the more powerful and elemental the people become and the less they require dwellings and shelters wind is fundamental to skyrim and the nords those that live in the far wastes always carry a wind with them so yeah the idea that breath and wind is is essential to them it's almost like they have some kind of magical connection to it and it's cool how it ties in with obviously the thorm and the voice and being breathed onto the world. But even like you look at other aspects of the voice, I know this is a really niche reference, but bards, like, you know, using mm. their voice to sing and bards are extremely prominent in Nord culture. Like it seems we- like anything to do with breath, voice, air, just, yeah, because it's wins. it's easy to, um, after playing Skyrim, it's kind of easy to perceive the form as just being like uh, like casting spells. It's just a tool to use, but it's it before that, or in the lore at least, it's very much tied into their culture and it it drastically changes a lot about them you know like the idea that they wouldn't use see they wouldn't develop siege engines because they can just stand in a in a in a v and just scream at the door and and blow the gates down Um, because that's such a cool what i've always liked about those early interpretations too is it's using like their like magic type of magic system or whatever to basically circumvent problems with like the barbarian archetype so mm. you know they're resistant to cold so they can wear like their cool you know shirtless barbarian sort of outfits they don't need all of this big engineering they really can just be berserkers with axes because if they do ever ha- you know obviously the problem with that is oh well you can't beat advanced technology you need siege engines and stuff to beat castles and be big conquerors but they can because they can just blow down the walls. And it's, so I love those, you know, examples in, you know, any world building, I guess, when you use the magic to sort of just make something work like that. Like, so basically making barbarians practical. Yeah. Um, it, it but is, obviously they sort of, you know, shifted it around a little bit, you know. Yeah, they changed it a lot. Although it does fit in with that parabolic Kalpa theory, doesn't it? Of how things yeah. are like more magical and then you come to the present and they're like more mundane. Yeah, I, he, I don't know. We, 
I wonder what you guys think. My hot take is like, I actually like the dragon cult and dragon. The dragon lore is quite interesting. Like, you know, on its own and as it is. But I would like, if I was like to, to do it all again, I would remove the whole dragon connection Voice. and just leave it as like Alduin was a Ragnarok kind of thing and an enemy rather than this whole dragon cult and the dragons connected to the Thorm and the Voice and everything like that. Instead, keep it separate and like, you know, flesh out the lore of the Nords as they were with all of the... Almost, you, you know, it's it's not really possible, but you could almost have it be retconned in a sense that Dragon was just p- potentially some kind of moniker used for um, ancient Nords, you know. So the Dragon War could have just been a civil war between two Nordic factions or something like that. I mean, the, the idea that... I mean, obviously you can't do that now, but yeah. th- that idea would have really added to well, Nordic lore. Th- well, that's the it, thing. Like taking Skyrim... me back to the, the episode where it's the Companions are dragons oh yeah coming from yeah. a more flying we've, we've together we've been in the iceberg too much because yeah. skyrim basically like the game brought in a, pretty much all the dragon stuff basically like before that i'm pretty sure it was just you know there was alduin as like this ragnarok figure and dragons had been in the past but all of the the dragon cult in in general wasn't even a thing but you um, could have done that without messing with the voice like you could actually keep the cool parts to do with dragon wars and the cults and stuff that are cool but then just mm. not give them the, the thorm and say it's dragon language do it's you know just an mean? opportunity could, cost thing i think they could have gone you could have kept them separate yeah but they could have like yeah just i mean not i'm done it at all i'm not like look the dragon even the dragon stuff like fighting dragons and stuff in skyrim is is not like gimmicky is the wrong word but it's kind of like a, a one hit thing like you've first playthrough it's like whoa cool dragons everything you do all that and then after you're like oh he's another dragon this is annoying it's just another enemy type it could have been cool if there were way less dragons and just more named ones and then each one was more quality like i'm not saying the ones because they did named ones and then didn't tell you anything about them yeah although does it feel more gimmicky because we're 10 years on from yeah uh, that yeah it, it does it does but i think scott's point still stands that they don't need it because it did feel gimmicky like even after a long playthrough you go back and play skyrim again and it's like oh do i even want to do the main story straight away because then i'm gonna have dragons just appearing when i fast travel somewhere and causing me problems and things but all that that, all that aside the the nords are the way they are now and and it still is like you know all of the lining up for the siege engine and stuff that's all in the ancient history as well it's just now that the thorm is attached to dragons and you know they've worked in things like you know saying that you know, they can say that people sort of work with the law and go like, oh, Parthenax taught the Nords at the behest of Kine and, and, and so on. So that sort of links it all together. But um, yeah, so I, I, I think for the current law, I think it makes more sense that they are from Atmora. It's just more congruent with all of the other law. However, if you go watch the video we made a while ago called um, Secrets of Atmora, that um, talks about a theory and explaining how, like, if there is a sundering of of Aldmeris and so on, it, they could have both act- both can actually be right. They could have been breathed onto the world by Kine, and then actually, you know, when the sundering of the continents happened, they were like left up on that side of of Atmora, and you know, came back later, and that's why it's the return, you know, of his girl. Oh, he actually returned another time, but you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Makes sense. I guess a lot actually changed if you think about it. I mean, you go and look at ancient Nord religion versus mm. just standard Nordic pantheon versus what it turned into in Skyrim, which is basically just following the uh, divines. Yeah, and I mean, that's the kind, kind of a bit of the problem with, with Skyrim's lore. I think it's one of the worst things it did was um, it gets rid of, of the you know the Nordic pantheon, which is called ancient Nordic pantheon. But it's I'm pretty sure it seems to apply that the Nordic pantheon as you know kind sure etc we're all worshipped up until like you know in the third era like it's this mm. this imperializations only happened in like the last 200 mm. years because uh, i remember there's npcs and stuff that would reference them um by their nordic names and you know uh, they have a lot of expressions with the old gods but you don't actually find anyone i think except at froki's shack where froki is a follower of kind specifically mm. you don't really find nords worshipping the old gods I mean, and before the Nordic pantheon, even they have all the animal gods that they worship, and then um, there are design documents that like 
were just design documents for Skyrim that like actually matched the animals up with the gods. So you yeah. have like I think um, Shaw is like some of the fox. He's a fox. Yeah, some of those have been confirmed um, in, in Elder stuff, Scrolls Online. So, yeah. yeah, it's cool that they actually brought that stuff into the online game. Yeah. It's 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 the same situation as the Khajiit. How like they've created like you know there's all these like oh there's cool ancient religion, but now it's like posts just this riddle thar stuff and all that kind of is the modern contemporary sort of Khajiit song. Same mm-hmm. as like how contemporary Nords are way less cool than their ancient counterparts and. It's kind of just <laughs> yeah because that's the thing when obviously a lot of time has passed since then but when the divines first came into being when alicia kind of forged them basically from mix mixing elements of the nordic pantheon with the elven pantheon the the nords weren't really that interested in any of the elven elements and really only nords who were living in you know who were living closely to the uh to the empire would really have cared about even following the divines they, they there's no reason why they couldn't just keep mm. their own totems and just you know it, it was the in, involving the nordic gods in the divines was only really to benefit the humans who who lived in cyrodiil who didn't really like their elven oppressors yeah and the nords too and this i guess you know what we should do we should kind of like actually hit make a big call but like Humanity has a lot to thank the Nords for because without the Nords, there would be no Elysian Rebellion. Like the Elysians relied hugely on the Nords and that's why the whole Eight Divines thing was like, you know, a bit of a compromise. Like they can't just have all of these elven elements because they've got to keep their Nord friends happy and so on. In the Nordic Empire at this time was, you know, expanding and Skyrim and it was down into Cyrodiil and they helped, you know, liberate the the Nidic population of Cyrodiil. Um, Mm. And, you know, so... for those for those reasons like and you know nords were the yeah you know isgrimor's coming and everything and the, and the growth of the nordic empire um was the only reason that uh elven dominance ever really ceased you yeah I mean? for sure so it's like without it like you know you know you just gotta I, you don't know what's exactly what have happened maybe that's an interesting what if video what if what if the uh what if isgrimor never came yeah <laughs> i guess the Merethic era would just keep going because i mean really that's like era of the elves if yeah you, like Mer, Merethic era hmm. well a bit yeah keep it going because obviously the the yakudans and the red cards had some influence like there, there were the duraki needs who were out in the west and they they did fairly well they weren't immediately subjugated by elves but yeah. then if you go east there initially i don't i think this is fairly new law but there are hints at needs having lived in morrowind before you know before um the nords conquered a bunch of it except i don't think they fared quite as well and there was need um need uh fights with um kaima i'm pretty sure yeah in there as well but but like overall like needs most places except maybe the duraki needs um were pretty much under the thumb of some kind of yeah. elf or they were just, you know, reclusive primitive sort of tribes or scattered around. But, you know, there was no uh, superpowers of... It, um, it was they, they wouldn't believed. stand a chance, basically, against yeah. all of the elvish armies and, like, the Dwemer. Or, yeah, like, it was know. generally believed that the, the, the needs who became the Bretons were the best off of pretty much all the needs. And they were, you know pretty well subjugated by the elves and were pretty much just used as you know breeding slaves for the most part so yeah without the nords turning the tables the uh the era of elves the morefic era would probably never have ended but perhaps this is all part of the like you look at the imperials with their luck power right that's what it is the nords came to help them it's their innate luck and that's why they always win. They got the empire and Maybe. they got big and strong. <laughs> it's just luck. They just roll the dice well. It's interesting too. Like even the the whole reason for the Chimer and Dwemer um, teaming up mm. is only to fight off the Nordic oppression that like you know that had taken over their um, taken over Resdane. So it's like if the Nords were never there for that to happen, like I doubt the Dwemer or Chimer would have ever got along because they're so like you know absolutely opposed on either ends of their philosophy goes to show how powerful the nords were in that time that mm. you know the dwemer and the kaima who were considered pretty pretty strong needed to team up despite all their problems just to stop the poxy humans coming over the mountains yeah i think people definitely overstate the power of the dwemer like they the dwemer and the kaima together got stomped over all over by the nords 
like some barbarians come up, just start shouting and stuff and throwing axes and they, you know, take over your whole but land. I guess that's well, the thing though. The Nords, I think it's not so much that the Dwemer are overestimated. I think Nords are just underestimated Yeah. because they are viewed as just barbarians throwing axes. I, no, I definitely think it's a Dwemer overstated well, thing. I think with the Dwemer... Yeah, there's... just because people like go, like they make out that the Dwemer are like you know, it can just fix everything and they're like time traveling everything and just doing like basically kind of the way they talk about them is like, you know, indestructible. Like if they didn't disappear, they'd be like, yeah, you know, I mean, running they, the world. There's like, an important stuff. thing to say about the Dwemer in that defensively, I feel, I feel like they would still be fairly untouchable because, mm-hmm. you know, if, if the Nords had been left to go crazy in Morrowind, they would have conquered the surface perhaps, but I doubt they would have had much um, luck dealing with the Dwemer if they wanted to get rid of them completely. You know, yeah. defensively, I imagine the Dwemer would be pretty hard to Could, stop. Because the one thing to remember for the Dwemer and so on is like people like these, all the tonal architecture was done with all of like, you know, big machines and engineering and all this kind of stuff. It's not just like magical powers click because if that were the case, then they could just do everything and just take over mm. everywhere and they would but, have no problems. Yeah, it's but that, that thing. does it's- tend to be one of those like riding things where it's like really the high elves should be really good with sword because they've lived to 500. But then there's just stories of like different armies like, oh, the Imperial army here just beat this group of... You know, yeah, but Elvish armies aren't more so much about martial like, like necessarily I, I, I suppose, the but individual. You- there's way more... Like, I mean, there's you, so many variables. You could find there. you could find stories even though of individuals where that's the case. I mean, it's kind of like Fallout, where it's like, why doesn't the Institute just teleport everywhere and win? It's like because yeah. then that's a silly story. Yeah, yeah, poor Ryan. But I, I think look, it's just that it's in the law that the Dwemer gets stomped all over, yeah, yeah, and that they have to. So I'm sort of like, I'm, they were very clearly powerful. It's mm-hmm. just that you've got to like. That's why I think the rain Nords, it in. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Generally, people do overhype the Nords, but. Uh, sorry, overhype the Dwemer, hmm. but underhyping the Nords happens all the time too. Because it's easy to just think they're, oh, they're just like humans, but big and strong, and they like mead, hmm. and they're good in the cold. Like, uh, it map. is a shame they've lost the voice. Hmm. Like, well, b- before we, I mean, we can get onto Jurgen Winkler in a second, but a good way to demonstrate exactly what you say, Mike, was to show that map of um, how much territory the Nords had at that specific point in the early first era. Mm. And, you know, it's they're not just isolated to their frozen wastes in, in Skyrim. And in Skyrim, they had a fair amount of land before yeah. things started to turn around. Plenty of land to the east and west. And, I mean, they got all of Morrowind at one point. And the reason they didn't really go into Cyrodiil, at least northern Cyrodiil at that time, was it just wasn't worth it. They were like, uh, Jarrell Mountains are annoying and I don't know if I really want to take the area around you know, Bruma slash bit lower. But then they got their, um, and allied with the Elysians and so on. And yeah. Sort of, that's why I guess why they didn't, they didn't, they liberated the Elysian, helped mm. to liberate them, not conquer them. Yeah. You know what I mean? But yeah, I, I think, I definitely think, but, but still Nords are also, I guess, underrated in times. Like, especially I can, I can talk all the time about it, but in the 36 lessons of Vivek, some of the like descriptions of the, what they call the demon chieftains, um, in there are really, really cool and mythological. And it makes the Thum sound so much more otherworldly and dangerous. Like they're not just running around going Fusro Dar. It's like there's Hoaga who's like eating mouthfuls of mud and then churning it into like these like thrall kind of armies and so on. Or there's like, you know, talking about them, how they're just uplifting height and, you know, blowing entire villages into the sea and stuff. And like, it just yeah. sounds really otherworldly and epic rather than... Yeah. You know. It sounds like it's much more on the level of some of the things you would hear about sword singing, like the Pancrado sword sunk a continent. Like it's that level yeah. of like don't su- superpowers, basically. Don't worry, we'll get we'll get there when Elder Scrolls Six comes out and Hammerfell, and it's all sword singers, and it's just like <laughs> fire sword. Press LB to get your fire sword ability. Or make it rain thunder swords from the sky. Yeah, yeah. I hope not. Or spin really fast in a circle and create a cyclone of swords. Yeah. To send people flying through the air. I hope, yes. I hope not, but you never know. But let's uh, bring it back to the Nords. Like, I feel like we can, I feel like we'd get lost a little bit on like talking about theories around, mm. um, you know, at Morans or not and all of that kind of stuff. But what we can establish is obviously the Dragon War and the dragons did happen. Like that was all a fundamental part of their early culture, even on Skyrim. And then eventually we, we can kind of glaze over that because, you know, we've, 
talked. Everyone knows about the dragon. I, I guess we, we should say so like long. to to the listeners that there'll be lots of podcasts coming. So we'll have time to discuss some of the things that we talk about today in more detail. But to try and cover everything with the Nords, you're going to have five hour podcast. Yeah. Like if yeah. you were to do it all in its totality. Yeah. There'll yeah. be yeah, so we can walk it forward a little bit and it, it's hard to... Like, later descendants of Isgrimor, they're at the first, like, uh, dynasty of kings are all descended from Isgrimor up till about up to King Borgus, which we'll get to. But um, I think it's King Harold, I think it is, who wipes out the last of the dragon cult and so on. And I think that's... Um, I might actually have to pull up the timeline. Um, but it's pretty early... Uh, pretty early on. Yeah, the attack fall, so 140, and that's even before, like, the Elysian. So the Dragon Cult is basically eliminated or very fringe before even the Elysian Slave Rebellion. So in terms of, like, your, like, understanding the timeline, Dragon Cult stuff is, like, Morethic Era and early, early First Era, like, like, first hundred years, if not before, you know? So it's kind of like... Um, at that t- at this time, they're very much, I guess, the ancient Nordic pantheon is what you could expect uh, as they go on. And obviously, they go. Uh, time goes on a bit. They help the Elysian Rebellion, and I'm pretty sure this happens underneath. Yeah, the Skyrim Conquest. So Vraga the Gifted, he is the the Nord who basically, um, you know, he's high king. He's one of the descendants of, of Isgrimor. He basically uh, conquers all of Resdane and High Rock and, and northern parts of Cyril and everything. He spreads his domain massively. Um, so he's one of the, hence why he's called the Gifted. And uh, then he helps the Elysian Rebellion get started. Um, well, not get started, but be successful. And uh, yeah, so then, then we end up with, you know, what they call the Nordic Empire, but it is kind of still like a kingdom. Like they didn't have an emperor. They just had their like king. But uh, yeah, so that was uh, quite big. But then we keep going a little bit more further in, in time um, and we get to the Elysian Order and the rise of the Elysian Order in the Elysian Empire, which is that zealous, crazy cult. They're, anyway, we, we've talked about them before, so you understand it. But they basically take over the empire. They, they start enforcing a lot of these Elysian doctrines. They're really strict, um, very anti-Elven. But this actually proves to be uh, a kind of a fun, uh, no, not fun <laughs> idea, but, <laughs> but a well-liked idea amongst, amongst a lot of Nords all of, with all the anti-Elven sentiment and particularly King Borgus, the 13th in the line of Iskramor, decides that uh, he wants to adopt the Elysian faith. Um, and he brings, so obviously he introduces the Elysian faith to, um, to Skyrim. Then there's events that move forward. There's some wars with the Elysians in High Rock and so on and you have a few kings in between. And then we get to Wolfarth which we talked about, Wolfarth, and he's what brings, he brings back the ancient Nordic pantheon. Um, and and then we sort of end up with a Skyrim that is, that is, has been reduced with the War of Succession in between the end of the reign of King Borgus, who died in the Wild Hunt. Um, I should have said that before, but yeah. He's going to say, yeah, that'd be important <laughs> to mention what important happened mention, when he yeah. sided with the Elysians. So, sorry, let's let's just walk it back a little bit. But So he was siding with the Elysians and he went down to Cyrodiil and he's like, yeah, let's take over Valenwood with them. But pre- preemptively, it seems that the Bosma used the Wild Hunt to eliminate King Borgus and this left a power vacuum because they couldn't properly elect a, uh, a Jarl. So then there was the Skyrim War of Succession. And because of this civil war that was happening... That is what allowed um, some of that. Allowed, what's what allowed the first council, the Chimera and the Dwemer, to team up and actually push them out because they were dealing with strife already. Um, the Nords were. So then, basically, you get the crumbling of the of the Nordic Empire throughout the Skyrim uh, War of Succession, and then you're left with roughly more or less what Skyrim is today, and that's kind of how it remains for you know more pretty much the rest of time until till now. Like they never really get that big empire back. Um, maybe it was just in his Grimoire's blood, you know? Like, it was uh, only those kings could do it. Maybe, yeah. but I mean, they also did stop using the voice, so... Yeah, well, I Th- think... That's like, I feel like that's like, you're a Jedi and you, like, stop using the Force. And you're like, <laughs> we're just going to use lightsabers. Like, that's still cool, but yeah, no no Force stuff. Like, you gimp yourself so hard. <laughs> yeah, because the idea is that... Um, you weren't supposed to be you, you didn't want to go the way that Alduin went where it was very much 
you use your power for your own benefit versus dealing with threats to your people and your life or, or whatever else so when it came so using the the voice for conquest was kind of frowned upon by kine you know at least according to jürgen Windcaller when he started his uh movement um so yeah that definitely meant that their history was going to become a lot less uh you know eventful in terms of expansion because, yeah I, I if i'm i hope i'm not wrong i'm pretty sure jürgen Windcaller. Um, hold on, unless I'm wrong. I just, I'm pretty sure he is. Oh, no, 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 sorry. It is in the pocket guide of the first edition. My bad. But, what um, were you going to say? A Skyrim edition? Yeah, a Skyrim edition. But it's interesting that he doesn't really have, uh, like, any specific date of when he was around. Hmm. Well, what, was because he specifically he in response to um, one of the battles in Morrowind? Um, or the loss at Red... Was it the loss at Red lo- Mountain that made him think, why are we ah. failing? Why do tongues fail? Okay, so it's when... What. It would have been like proper round 700 then, like the yeah. actual battle of Red Mountain when the Nord supposedly... You know, you have like Dagoth and... Well, depending on the Wolfarth stories, they say like, you know, Dagoth came and convinced them to come and try and take, take back Shaw's heart. Yeah, because I think it's on one of the tablets that says like, uh, you know, he went to meditate for seven years to figure out why powerful, powerful tongues fail or something like that. Um... Which yeah, I I, I will have and what, the what's quote his, in a second. What's his conclusion that we just? Uh, yes, yeah, so shouldn't conclusion, use the voice unless it's to. I knew it. Okay, I knew it. Self defense. The gods or yeah, self defense. Essentially, one edition though. It's in the first pocket guide to the Empire edition. It says, basically, um, you know he, you know, Jürgen Windcaller was a thing, but then um, it says, in gratitude, the Emperor Type Septum has recently endowed a new Imperial College of the Voice in Markarth, dedicated to returning the way of the voice to the ancient and honourable art of war. So it may be the mighty deeds of Nord heroes of old will be soon be equaled or surpa- surpassed on the battlefields of the present day. But that's basically, you know, implying, like, you know, this is written sort of third era. This is implying that that there is this sort of Imperial College, like in the times of Oblivion or something, there would be this Imperial College of the voice and it's actually a taught skill not just the greybeards going no 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 i think it's actually the greybeards oh maybe it's not i don't know maybe the greybeards are just powerful sort of things but what i'm saying is it sort of seems like the voice could have been around in the third era and so on at that time but i feel like it's kind of retcon well it, yeah, yeah it weighs the idea that the greybeards obviously the followers of jürgen Windcaller, wanted to keep it under wraps or keep it quiet and then it's it's actually kind of funny that if if what you're getting at is Tiber Septim has kind of given the green light for for Nords to use the voice in in an offensive way again, that almost sounds like the uh, the influence of Wolfarth, you know, yeah, through him. For sure. Yeah, and but like I I mean I wouldn't mind it. Like I would I would think it's a little bit um, cooler because remember also pre pre Skyrim the actual game there was no lore about dragonborn being like sucking up dragon souls and using the voice super well and so on it was always this sort of like meditative like learn it like this power within kind of thing um so it would have been a whole different skill set um that could have been cool but yeah anyway so it's based on your midichlorian count yeah um is how good you are with the voice anyway snap back to reality where are we (laughs) um so where did we leave off? So yeah, so the Nords Nords are driven out of Morrowind. They're back their tiny little um, empire, and then they have you know they sort of join various empires at different times. I know they come under Reman. Um, they then later come under Tiber Septum. There's not a lot. I guess one thing we should actually bring up culturally, maybe perhaps at the various times um, that. Eastern Skyrim is generally more conservative and, you know, stay true to the old ways and so on. And you got a lot of Western Skyrim that, you know, fluctuates and so on. And I think a lot of this, to be honest, is just geography. You've got Solitude, which is a massive port for the Empire. for the north. They're right next to High Rock. They're also like, you know, places like Falkreath and Whiterun. They're all... Um, you know, important trading posts and like connected sort of by land and trade routes to, to Colovia. Um, so you can imagine a lot more of a sort of cosmopolitan influence. Whereas if you look at places like Winterhold, Windhelm, Dawnstar, a lot more um, secluded, a lot more harsh land. That and obviously in. somewhere like Falkreath has the, the connection to 
Kula Kane and Hjalti Earlybeard, who mm. essentially founded the, the the Third Empire. So it's going to be an important part. It's you know it's it's where they started when they went on the, when the Tiber Wars before the Tiber Wars began, etc. So the the other thing about the East too is that the East is basically the bulwark against the Dunma and mm-hmm. have been and so they've been fighting. So there's this constant tension and conflict there, which can keep them you know very traditional, very screw the elves kind of attitude um, as well. Uh, but that that's that sort of like we see that kind of dynamic reflected all the way up until now when we have the Stormcloaks and the um, Imperial backed Jarls. Mm. But yeah, um, it's, what would we like to talk about next? Where well, do we want to I move think this conversation because there's a lot th- of yeah, places. there's so much stuff. I'm just thinking like obviously Nordic culture is really cool to talk about, just yeah. in general Nordic culture, but also some of the ancient ancient history like with Sarthal and stuff but i feel like we've covered that a lot before too like if you want a good uh wrap up of the events of Sarthal and isgrimor go watch the let's explore one of skyrim's unsolved mysteries videos where video where i look at the temple of scrib but at the start i basically do like a neat summary of the whole thing Mm. and the basic takeaway of that is this is kind of the catalyst for nordic disdain for elves because you know for a little while they got along but then the night of tears happened where a bunch of needs got slaughtered all but is and his sons they flee or they head back to atmora come back with their companions and then the snow elves regret what they did because they will get wiped out. So, you know, that kind of sets the tone for the Nords for centuries after that. Yeah. Well, we could talk about, like, so in terms of just general culture, we can start talking about just, like, obviously their aesthetic is very, like, uh, Viking, you know, Scandinavian Viking kind of things, or, you know, little bits of, uh, what do they call like, the, the kingdoms of uh, Rus, or Rus, R-U-S, you know what I'm talking about, Russia, basically, ancient Russia, when you had that... Um, but those kinds of uh, parts of it have sort of been um, removed over time and they're just more straightforward Scandinavian kind of Vikings. They even, but even older lore so had a little bit of like, you know, kind of like uh, Celtic elements and so on in there mm. as well. And obviously, but, I was going to say that they, they praise being very tough yeah. and, and you, strong. Like warrior culture is definitely not an understatement. Like there's the stories of young men going out into the snow and the high peaks of mountains for weeks to hunt ice wraiths as a way to claim like their full status as a citizen like all these old legends and stories are really cool it's cool that they made you do that uh to join the storm cloaks it's yeah. kind of like preserving that history like go hunt the ice yeah. the ice wraith i thought that was really yeah, cool that's a, that, that's a nice with the empire you kind of just like sign the form and <laughs> mm. and, and get going I think too, and this is something that, you know, they, they say that uh, Nords in their culture have been quite uh, superstitious and they have bad omens and things like that. You can imagine like, you know, the I think it is a canis route to stop the werebears coming or it's like, oh, anything bad happens. It's the Falmer, the, the snow elves that come and take your children away or, or like all wrongdoing. So they have all of this sort of superstition. That's actually something I feel like we didn't see a whole lot of. I mean, that's a lot of, that's what a, a people's, a lot of critiques of Skyrim is, is that a lot of the Nords act, it's just kind of like, you know, hollywood vikings but they're just kind of like us that makes sense like but it's like where are all the characters who are doing these things and like yeah. are really superstitious about x y and z and uh, do you know what i mean like you kind of got that vibe with i mean it's an entirely different culture but you got a feeling of that vibe with the skull like it would have been cool to have that that energy more yeah. on skyrim with certain people even if they obviously don't worship the all maker but just that vibe being present in Skyrim a lot more, like that tribal, like you said, superstition. Mm. It is cool. I mean, you do actually see evidence of Falmer doing stuff. There's bits and pieces mm. where you kind of like, and that's like all cool superstitions. It's There's a nugget of truth to them. If they're just yeah. a superstition, like, you know, oh, this spirit comes in the night, but you never see it. It's like, okay. But I don't... if you actually see like a dead guy on the road and he's got Falmer arrows in his back, but there's no Falmer in sight, then it's cool. Cause it's like, hmm. I don't want to turn this too much into like, um, like a rant or, or a sort of uh, hot take video, <laughs> but, but like, here we go, <laughs> but here we go, but I'm going to do, do it, it anyway. anyway. Yeah. Yeah. No, but like one thing that 
frustrates me a little bit when people so like people might hear these critiques and be like well it's not realistic they can't put it in the game or so on it's like oh of course they're just stories it's not going to be it's all going to be exaggeration and like you know and and hyperbole etc it's but it's sort of like but it's a fantasy world like it's like why not have it in the fantasy world that it talks about it like let's have the mythology you know the actual yeah you know cool stuff actually be there rather it being watered down because then it's like oh realism within it because it's like oh of course he didn't actually do xyz but the, is that it actually a common a take huh is that actually a common take that people have that like that stuff's not there because it's not well imagine having that attitude towards morrowind yeah morrowind seems to embody all of those but then again you know it was a long time ago it's 2002 Mm. so but yeah all all of the things you think oh surely that wouldn't work out too well i've seen it around i think it's more so in responses it's just like the the default assumption for all a lot of mythological texts um you know i know 36 lessons of work has other like shade on it but you know plenty of these mythical sort of things described in the books and the law i said like of course that's not the real way it went down because you know it has to be like our real world where people's ancient ideas of myths or the world was you know the reason mount olympus all this kind of whatever stuff like any other mythology we go like oh yeah it's not real because you know science xyz practical like we can't replicate it see it but applying that kind of thing to 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 the law like because they basically cast an equal amount of doubt but it's like we're in this world though where (laughs) all of this sorry you're just making me think of this comment i don't want to call out the guy but i mean i'm not gonna i don't even know who the comment the commenter is but you remember the comment that was on the Temple of Scrib video and it was like, I've got a simple explanation for why there's a different banner, economics, and then goes on this whole rant about how the Dwemer were using contractors who they would like basically have on their payroll <laughs> to like make their banners for them. And then the contractor ran out of ink and, and got a different ink. And like the comment was so confident though. He was so sure about this like real world economic viewpoint. I'm like, dude. But that's what I'm sort of saying. It's like reducing things to, to this, like to, you know, the simplest kind of causes or so on. And like, you know, debunking superstition and all that kind of stuff is something that's very practical in our real world or so on. But in a world where there is quite literally gods and magic and all this kind of stuff, it, it doesn't make sense that you would cast the same amount of shade on these mythological kind of happenings in books and so on. Um, you know what I mean? It's yeah, the same. Absolutely. Plus yeah. a big part of the fun is taking things that were quite clearly just developer mistakes or things that were just done by the devs completely without any thought and taking that and forging theories from it. And then some of them, I wouldn't be able to name one off the top of my head, but then some of them kind of becoming accepted canon and being used in future games. It's like, yeah, yeah part, part of the fun of this stuff and why we mm. still do it, you know, why we still love it after all these years is because mm. there's just so many ways you can interpret all of this lore and to yeah. just give it the mo- to give everything the most basic explanation, but, would but this be is boring. Uh, yeah, I I agree. But it's like the explanations people give sometimes when they try and like work their way around things that there is no answer for. They're not even simple. They're actually complex, but they're based in real world things. You're like, oh yeah, that sounds right. But it's like really, like Dwemers having like banner makers on a payroll <laughs> yeah well, it's like well, it's like when they, like well, that's they the wouldn't thing. do like, it themselves like not everything's this capitalist like exactly they're applying lens. like the oh, and I, I think that's what sucks about <laughs> even a lot of fantasy stuff can do it is they apply real world sensibilities real world economics and like sorry what i mean real world i mean like modern, modern our yeah. contemporary stuff all to it like you know that's why actually a lot appeals to me or so on about like cu- cultures like the reachman or even the dunmer or these cultures that have these kind of like even orcs yeah orcs they have these what by contemporary modern standards they're distasteful you know um attitudes but they're really interesting because they're alien and different and unique and they, they come from such a they they come from a different context and a different time like how if you go back in time in our own history really early humans do some really whack shit and they think it's real. Like, they're not going, oh, I'm doing this funny stuff. It's like, no, they think if I eat these horses nuts, I'm going to get superpowers or something like that. And then everyone around them also believes that. Yeah. And then, then you know. Look, placebo, Scott, placebo is eating, strong. Eating horse nuts is not going to catch on. <laughs> Stop trying to make it happen. Man. Yeah. But, but to tie it back to Nord to superstitions, <laughs> um, it, it is funny how, you know, the idea that they blame everything on the Falmer and, and um, there is the idea that they're, they're pulling you know sneaky stuff behind the scenes but 
I mean, contextually, it's very. It must be really weird if if you live in a place where these like gremlin golem creatures hiding about, and and they, they you know they're semi intelligent, and the reason they're they're so miserable and and everything about their existence is awful is because you, your race absolutely destroyed them <laughs> completely. And it's like, well, maybe they do have a grudge against you. It probably isn't that far fetched. If they can remember, then yeah, they probably who, want to get their revenge. Who started it? I guess it all. It all depends I'd, on if they... Sl- I mean, they started it, I guess, but the Eye of Magnus, like, was that under Sarth or were they trying to get that? Were they just... Did they just fear the Nord's culture was surpassing theirs? Two wrongs don't theirs? make a right, Michael. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> no, no, but I wonder... What about if, three wrongs? How many, people, <laughs> how many people died at Sarthal? Can you... Is there a number on that? I can't remember, but it can't have been, like, crazy big. It was described yeah. as a settlement, but then it's also a decent-looking city, but then they also had, obviously, had some clearly powerful kind of architecture. By the way, which is another thing we can talk about their culture, but obviously a lot of their uh, architecture is also made of um, wood. But they're quite the good architects in the way that, like, Isgrimor's Palace, um, you know, stands for a long, long time. Although I'm pretty sure that might have been knocked and rebuilt. I'm not sure. But a lot of their wooden structures are really resilient and almost otherworldly. Like, look at Dragon's Reach. It's been around for for ages and it's a a lot of wood um, using its construction. Or you can look at the boats, like, you know, Yorvaska, the home of the companions. You know, you could... This is the thing where it's like... That's a uh, that's supposedly the boat, the Yorvaska, that came over with the 500 companions, flipped upside down and turned into a longhouse. People can cast shade on that because, oh, nah, that's just a lie and so on. It's like, but in this world, they they literally came and with 500 companions just wide genocided yeah. an entire race. Like, is it really so unbelievable that their boat's really strong well, one or thing durable? Is, one thing as well is um, normally you'd make the argument that, you know, in, in, what, in how we see White Run in Skyrim... Um, your Vasca would have rotted thousands of years ago, but um, even in a real world context, if if uh, if the climate's cold enough, and if if Skyrim is like it used to be described, then a wooden structure can last. You know, theoretically, it can last forever. <laughs> you know, there's like there's no reason it would rot if it's cold enough. Mm. Um, so, but you True. know, obviously, the way White Run is a very sunny and nice place a lot of the year, so you'd think it would rot. But either way, yeah, as you said, it's kind of like well. Okay, yeah, with all this stuff going on, we're not going to talk about at what speed wood yeah. rots at what temperature. <laughs> well, one thing we haven't covered, um, actually, and it's probably the place we really should talk about, but it is the Nordic Pantheon. Like, we don't need to talk about the Imperial one that they worship today. We know that. But uh, does anyone else well, want to I, talk? I guess one of the coolest things about their Pantheon is that the head of their deities isn't uh, a version of Akatosh or Oriel. Mm. It's actually Lorcan, who they call Shaw. Yeah. Um, which I think is super cool. And the other thing is they give all of their, um, the members of their pantheon kind of like familial re- relations. So you have Kine, who Shaw is, is Shaw's, sh- sorry, Shaw is the husband of Kine. Kine is Shaw's yeah. wife. Um, and I guess another important part of that dynamic, just real quick, is that um, he, Shaw is known in their mythology as the dead chieftain of the gods he died in their mythology in before and yeah. that's why he's in sovereign guard and he's gathering souls in his hall and kine is known as the widow and that's of sure and kine actually becomes like like she is basically the head of their pantheon um because shaw's you know god of the underworld is gone like the current one that they would mm. you know pray to or they want for power or something is kind and that's why her importance with the breath and storm and yada yada and she carries them to sovereign guard when they yeah. die oh and she what quite literally created them in their mythology so, yeah, as well exactly like a mother and yeah. like sure almost like a father um and then sun is an interesting god because i believe there's no like um there's no contemporary version of sun or like you can't draw like it to anything direct like, equivalent yeah like junal being julianos and kine being kinnereth like sun is just sun yeah oh and well, she, we should... shield thane of sure and also a dead god well that's the thing too what's cool is that a lot of the and that's why he guards the whalebone bridge um because he's also dead but um you have a lot of these uh these gods are sort of evolutions of the old totemic religion so you know you have shore being the fox Kine being the um, the eagle, got uh, Mara as the wolf. Um, Sun's Debella, the bear. Yep, Debella being the moth. Um, 
uh, which ones? Uh, Junal is the owl and uh, Orkies Sto- the snake. Stun is the whale, I'm pretty sure, and yeah. Orkies the snake. Um, I was yeah. going to say, oh, that's another interesting thing just to throw out there. As you know about the imperialized divines, most of them are a mixture of previous things. So, you know, there's Kine, Kinnereth, Ma, both have Mara, etc. But uh, Debella is a human god, seemingly, or an Atmoran god. It seems to have come down with um, the Nords, which is just an interesting sort of... It, it's funny, but like the... I know when you think Nords, you think like, oh, big burly barbarians and so on. But a lot of their gods, their most important gods, are female as well. Like, and play a really important part. Like Debella being like artistic and, and, yeah, and stuff ca- like this. Yeah. And Mara is also known as the handmaiden of Kine mm. and concubine of Shaw, yeah. which is another... Inter- and that's the kind of thing where it's example, like those gods kind of imply that perhaps there is like a polyamory sort of situation for like powerful chieftains have multiple, like have a wife and like concubines and so on. It's something you never really see in... in they just kind of like act... The Jarls act exactly like the Counts of Oblivion. So they're very imperial in their yeah. sort of outside of just some trappings. It is it is cool though to see how the different gods have much different meanings. To be honest, in Nordic in the Nordic pantheon compared with mm. the Divine's pantheon, like even Stendar, who in their religion is Stun, who's actually the brother of Sun. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, yeah, like that's that's really cool. It actually makes me think who is Stendar's brother in other like religions. But um, anyway. He was the the god of ransom, like Stendhal, god of ransom, who taught the Nords the benefit of taking prisoners of war and how to do it. Like that's much it's, more hardcore than with, like. You well, let's so call the, that- the, the de- how it develops though, right? Because it's like the idea of taking taking prisoners, and then you've got Stendhal, who's about like merciful forbearance, mm-hmm. um, and you know taking a prisoner rather than just executing all your enemies is a in a way is a form of mercy. Yeah, you know, it's so the Nordic mercy, their yeah. version of things, you know. <laughs> That's as m- um, merciful as they get. And if anything, as we talked about how, like, Shaw Lorcan is the head of their pantheon, Alduin is how they understood Akatosh, and he is the the antagonist of their entire pantheon. He's the he's the world eater. He's going to come and bring, essentially, their equivalent of Ragnarok. That's is what the, the play is on but obviously we get a little bit of a different kind of view when we get to the sort of uh, dragon cult stuff and you get like akatosh quite literally being like i'm here to dominate the world and so on and that alduin Alduin, yeah Yeah. so so yeah but um i i kind of like his old interpretation of just the 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 harbinger of the end but less like a you know i'm king of the dragons and i'm going to dominate your but you know, yeah. maybe it's just me. And then we also have uh, Orki, which is a complicated one. Like the most typical idea is you could go like... It's Malakath, or- kind Orki. of. Yeah, like... Cause and RK. And in, RK. In, in, to an extent. Because if you think about what they're missing, they're missing RK and they're missing Zenithar. And I think that's the only reason. I've seen Sun compared to Zenithar, but it's I don't know It's a bit of a stretch. What. It's a stretch. It's yeah. just like, oh, it's the missing god, so let's just oh, give you it Zenithar. Oh, you mean Sun, T- yeah, Stun, Stendar, and then oh, Sun, sorry, right, Zenithar. yeah, 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 gotcha. But there's Zenithar. Um, I've seen that, but I think it's a bit of a weak comparison outside of that. Oh, well, what's the <laughs> we're missing of one? That? Yeah, pretty much. And but but then Orki would fulfill like the sort of RK kind of part. Um, yeah, I mean it's like a weird mix, and I guess that Orki was in Orki was involved in that battle with the Nords where he like. Um, didn't he make them ate. children? Yeah, well, he brought back the ghost of Alduin, who yeah. then ate the children down, uh, ate the Nords down to children. And they were like six-year-olds, and then... <laughs> yeah, which is what gave them shortened lifespans until Shaw chucked it back on the orcs, right? <laughs> and chucked yes. it on the nearby orcs, and that's why orcs have human lifespans. Yeah, instead it's of, instead of lifespans. Elvis. Yeah, exactly. And to them, he's known as the god of mortality. Um as well by the way what's interesting is i know before like he is the lone god for the nord or he is a lone god for the nords does that mean like lone like you know how people have a you know like romans had a lone god like they would loan like gods would lo- be loaned from the egyptians or so and they would adopt new gods is that's what it's saying or is it perhaps literally 
because that would you could interpret it two ways you could be like oh he's a god of like loans and debts and stuff like that or you could be it's like a, a god that has been adopted from another culture yeah i'm just i would say it's the it's it's he's been adopted that's how i would interpret that yeah i mean i can't see any connection yeah oh sorry it makes sense who seemed to have taken up his worship during aldmeri rule of atmora yeah so it seems like it's actually an aldmeri god that has been introduced to them which also explains why you know rk is part of their um pantheon i think that only to be honest i wonder how how much orky is connected to the orcs hmm well, I mean, he's still an enemy. He's still an yeah. enemy god for the he's, Nords. And the Nords oppose orcs and they oppose elves, so... Yeah, because I'm pretty sure Morlock, as in Malakath, is identified separately in their mythology yeah. too, in the Wolfarth story at, yeah. from Orky too. It is. So I wonder why it combines aspects of both. Maybe it's just the throwing the age onto the nearby orcs part. Complex stuff, eh? Yeah. It is. There's also other gods that, um, like Janal, who is meant to yeah. be Julianos, and and Janal is involved with like Nordic language and mathematics and I love runes the god of, and language and stuff like that. I love the uh, god of knowledge, him being god of knowledge and hermetic orders, which sort of implies like the more like philosophical kind of like you know actual like hermeticism. So it, it's like a, it's interesting that it makes the ancient clever man because it's used to yeah. like Junal fa- fell out of favor but you know mages used to be respected by ancient um nords and the clever man and it, but it makes it seem a little bit more like philosophical and like you know enlightened state kind of magic related rather than just like academia yeah hmm. spelliamus and falling like, out of favor wasn't that long ago Either right, it, it was f- um, the clever men falling out of favor. That was in response to the the uh, the great collapse, right? Or that was, was just ma- no. That was just majors in general. I think majors still were still not liked even before that okay. for a while. Clever men are like an ancient yeah. thing. I'm not sure to. I, I'm not exactly sure exactly when the shift would have happened, but obviously they were important. I guess even around the times of the dragon cult. To be honest, maybe in the dragon cult could have smeared them a little bit you know what i mean mm. like um you know because because you have essentially what a powerful like mages like each of the dragon priests and so on and they could have had a but then yeah like a lot then it was very much magic that helped them overcome that but the film i guess they would distinguish it differently yeah, you know what i mean yeah i guess like one of them they find like an innate like sort of meditative power that you know what i mean that's given to them from a kind versus like this witchcraft and i wish they played up that superstitious stuff more than it's something like in elder scrolls 6 if it is in hammerfell like i want to see those superstitious like red guards and stuff are really like anti-magic i don't want to Mm. see i don't want to just see the college of winterhold attitude towards magic just just all you know transplanted into hammerfell because it's just such a weak source like oh we don't like them but we tolerate them anyway like <laughs> it rather it's like no let's have some conflict there it's juicy let's make some you know fun yeah. Law. yeah i mean you can imagine in hammerfell seeing some really cool stuff with being super anti undead like i would want to see the ashabar and how like they despise they are despite them being killers of undead mm. like people are said to not like them simply because they are involved with the undead in any way yeah even though it, they're killing them you know what they and you know what thanks to all this eso law too like they might take it all into account and they might actually make a really sick elder scrolls 6 so just with I'm but but for. they'll have elder scrolls online like motifs and armor designs so it just looks oh, a little bit extra world of warcraft for you i i wish <laughs> i wish they would kind of go back to about oblivion ish maybe even more than like i just you know what I mean? Like, I just want realistic size, non paddle sword, non sort of like giant Warcrafty looking things. I don't know. I always play with like real, better shaped weapons or realistic sort of shaped um, weapon mods. Here and stuff he is at the scrolls. start of the video saying, "Let fantasy be fantasy." And now he's saying, "Why aren't my weapons real enough?" That's just an aesthetic preference. <laughs> and ultimately, you can do both. Like, I think it's the best when you have. Yeah, like, I, I agree. You can have a daedric. Because yeah, otherwise it's like a daedric that looks, artifact that looks thin. 
Like, yeah. Or Daedric Artifact as well. Yeah, well, like, yeah, but, like you, you could have your, your regular kind of smithed weapons be more realistic and more practical and then your strange gift from a Daedric Prince that can just kind of defy your normal rules of physics that stands out a lot more rather mm. than just being a skin over the top of a normal looking sword or something yeah. so you can have both yeah yeah because because otherwise you can you can also just like follow that all the way up to the sort of like let's have final fantasy and world of warcraft sort of designs like big giant swords yeah. the size of your head and it's just kind of but like, i mean we don't we don't need to use our imagination for this there are mods for skyrim now like we use them that actually is it better shaped weapons they just slim yeah. down the weapons a bit and but they still look super fantasy because you know yeah. it's a glass war just, axe and it's all curvy with elven oblivion for the most it's just tighter yeah oblivion for the most part all like the designs and so on all looked um oh, oblivion sweet, like had some fat looks. designs it did have some fat ones but a lot of their weapons were better shaped and yeah stuff like that but this is all uh not nord related <laughs> but you guys in the comments also say that you like when we go on tangents and stuff so mm. we can we've held back a little bit less recently i've been the that whole time i was trying to kind of theory craft on the fly because we were trying to figure out what it is about Orky there's just something not quite right and and one unusual thing I had seen was that before I think before there was um there was clarification that Shaw was very much associated with a fox a lot of people used to think that um or by a lot of people I mean a couple of forum posts I read ages ago that um, that Shaw was the snake because in a lot of cultures um Lorcan is considered to be a snake you know like I think um mm. the trickster in, god yeah yeah, so you got the Red Guard Pantheon, the Argonian Pantheon. I think he's a snake in both of those because you've got Tall Papa crushing him with a stick. And uh, I can't remember yeah. what he's called in uh, the Argonian one. But basically, yeah, he was kind of... Yeah, he's a sneaky snake. And um, there's definitely elements of Orki that you can kind of... You can almost see it as being the duality of Lorcan slash Shaw fighting against himself. But at the same time, I'm pulling this out of my ass. So we can... <laughs> we can yeah. You know, he might just be Arcane in Malakaf. Yeah. But uh, to be honest, he's actually like, he's one thing. He's, if I could like retcon slash fix Orki, I would. Because I don't know if he's like perfectly like, he's not like well executed, if you know what I mean. Like he kind of just muddles stuff up and it's like, ooh, mystery. But it's like, not in a good way. Kind of like just confusing, if that makes sense. Yeah. I don't know if you guys agree or not. But. I, I kind of agree when you try and dive into it, but when you just hear the stories, they sound pretty cool. Yeah, but like, what I'm I saying like is you could, stories, ki you could, you could make keep the better. stories and fix the god. Like, yeah, yeah, for sure. Is what I'm saying. Like, everything confusing about him isn't the good bits. It's yeah, just yeah. the sort of shade thrown over him. But, um, yeah, I think uh, the problem with discussing Nords is it's like I feel like we can kind of say a lot of things to you guys and it's just like... They have yarls, and then it's like you know <laughs> you've played Skyrim, like you've you you've kind of experienced it. Uh, I guess firsthand. We, the only thing you could touch on, obviously, is they worship like well, Izmir and and like um, I guess their, yeah. their love for Talos. I suppose you'd put with divines. Yeah, like yeah. I mean, you can kind of have, you know, the whole worship of Talos anyway. I guess if you want to get into the complicated stuff, where you have like Wolfarth is a component of Talos, so the old Izmir that they would you know, revere so much um, is the new is Izmir it, to them yeah. is Talos. and But, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. I mean, Nords are definitely one of those. It's it's funny because sometimes they're seen, you, they can feel rather plain, but then there's some really cool stuff in there. But they can't, um, you, you can't have the Elder Scrolls without them because mm. they are like the most... Mm. I one think, of the most central i think that's I such think. a cool video you should write what if the nords didn't didn't exist or didn't come to it well what if what if it basically or? i guess you go like what if isgrimor never came like what if they just stayed in atmore and so they're basically the you know the nords never come afterwards and yeah um, because it'd be an interesting thing because you'd only have needs and i guess you know you would still work that theoretical on with the let's just say the inevitability of yakuta sinking and the red guards coming still mm -hmm. so it would just be a different um world I, I wonder if um i mean so many different things would have needed to happen because i was going to say without the nords perhaps 
the the uh, needs in Cyrodiil could still have eventually overcome the Aelids, but maybe with the help of the Bretons. But at the same time, really, the, the, the way was par for the Bretons to rule High Rock because the Dereni had to deal with so many different problems, one of which being the Elysian Order. So, you know, without like, the Elysians, are there Bretons? I feel <laughs> like with all, like, mm. you know, with the Mora House and the Pact of Akatosh and Pelina Whitestrake, I feel like it's feasible you could still have the Elysian Rebellion be successful, but you could do to it, like, a differing degree, and then maybe, or maybe instead, the war isn't some, like, you know, over in a year or two or whatever it was. Instead, it's, like, a prolonged thing. Maybe you know, Pelinor like, just wipes out the entire elven population of Tamriel and becomes the god king of, of Tamriel. Yeah. And that's that's the uh, end of the story. Yeah, because he but probably the, could have done it single-handedly. See, there's interesting things, but would Pelinal have been there without the Nords? And this is an interesting thing because there's... Did he come over with them, perhaps, even? Because you know how there's the sort of whole thing of Pelinal Whitestrake being other characters like Hans the Fox and Harold Harry Breeks or whatever it was, and like he's got different you know, identities as previous kings and he would just make kingdoms and then leave and so on. But like, was this all happening as him being like, do you know what I mean? Like is his essence or him, and especially since he's connected to like, you know, as like a Shezarine or like related to Shaw slash Lorcan, which is a very like, at more thing. Like maybe he did come over with, not at first, like he could have been the Harold Harry Briggs and which, by the way, I just want to find that up. Um, hold on. Um, well, while you're doing that, yeah. I, I think Shaw's influence would have been there no matter what, because I feel like he backs humans. Uh, yeah. At the end of the day, he will back humans, because you know the, I've talked about this a lot before, but um, there's a huge emphasis on Akatosh being the one to kind of uplift the Elysians and help them, con you know, take over the Aelids. But um, really, most of it can be close. Cl more closely associated with Shaw and his role, and you know, and obviously, when his heart, when Lorcan's heart is being shot across the world, a drop of his blood falls into an Aelid well, and that's where the the red diamond is born. So th well, there's a lot of build up to it still there, even without the Norse. The, the one reason I bring that up and him being a thing that sort of came over with the Atmorans is so two of his. Uh, oh shit! I just lost. Uh, yeah. So. Um, it is claimed he had other names as an immortal sorcerer king, such as Izmir, which is a very a Nordic at Morny sounding thing. Harold Harry Briggs, which I which is very clearly a nod to, you know, the stories of Ragnar yeah. Lothbrok, Lothbrok meaning like shaggy breeches or so on, basically like hairy pants or whatever. Um, and then also Hans the Fox. But like these are all sort of, you know, like they would sound like names of Nords and stuff that, that you meet, um, and and so on. And, you know, between when he shows up as Pelinor Whitestrake and when Isgrimor first arrived, it's like minimum 700 years, you know, so it could have even been more. And that's plenty of time for him to come over, raise kingdoms and, and fall and so on. And Well, it's funny because Shaw is the fox too, like Hans the fox. It's Yeah, exactly. It's, it's cool. Yeah. But like, that's what makes me think is, is like, well, if Isgrimor never came and sort of that, you know, energy never showed I, up. I'll like, say this, if Shazar happened? was always looking out to have the backs of men, he took his time, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, if they were just being, like, dominated by the Aelids for so long. Because it's even things, because, yeah. yeah. I was going to say, like, even the Reachmen and so on, I wonder how they're, if they would even... Uh, I guess they call him Lork. But yeah, the dominant, also, you would, I guess you would never have Shazar. No. Not because the because because Shazar was just a compromise, so at least you would have just sw Lork. swept him under the rug completely if it wasn't for Nordic pressure, I think. Yeah, but like Law can uh, sorry, Shaw never really comes into their. They never really know who he is. Yeah, right. Mm. Because then they're just worshiping the elven gods like they worship. So then it's just men for like worshiping elven gods, and it'd be interesting. You'd never have Akatosh because unless well, unless they got strong you could still maybe but yeah like i mean you could have the gods essentially giving visions to someone like alicia anyway you know like whoever yeah. answers her call um and provides pelinor and mora but house, then they again can just pass on the message but if you make the argument if the, if there is no pelinor like no pelinor figure there and if it is just a, a mora house job <laughs> <laughs> i don't know of how far it's, it's gonna it get. just becomes a, a big province of minotaurs and <laughs> Yeah. It's forever changed. Look, I think it, I think it's fairly safe to say, even though there's a lot of uh, variables here, that without the Nords, you wouldn't have had this the big change in tone from Tamriel being very much Elven controlled to being human controlled. 
that never that shift would never have happened were it not for is Grimoire bringing his companions yeah to skyrim yeah absolutely yeah. all right nice yeah. I, I, th I think unless you guys have got anything extra to add we already talked about the dragon cult a fair bit in the dragons podcast so hence why we didn't dwell on that part too much but yes. i feel like we we can come back with some more focused conversations mm. on All right, well, well tell us in the elements. comments below what topics you would want to see us cover on a future podcast obviously not the next one that involve the nords so specific topics maybe you want a podcast all about the voice and all the philosophy involved with that so you let us know in the comments below social media links are there too and we look forward to nerding out with you again very soon